Well, um, thanks for hanging in today on this whirlwind tour. Um, I always feel like SQL is a hard subject to approach, but um, I hope you all feel a little bit more comfortable with it and getting down into the, the SQL level of things. Um, it does definitely takes time and, and reps to kind of feel confident in it, but um, you know, it's very, it's a very useful and important skill. So um, we have a little bit of time left, um, about 20 minutes and I'd like to open up to questions that you might have for me and Jack about, um, we both have done a lot of different jobs in programming. Um, so we could talk about that. Uh, Chicago tech scene, various technologies, including Ruby, Go, Postgres, Vim, uh, React. And uh, for myself, um, you know, having come from the military, I'd be glad to answer any questions you might have. So um, fire away. I got a question on how does a, a company like Twitter handle um, posts that like when a user deletes their account, their, the, their posts that they made don't get deleted. They're, they still stay, but yet that person's account no longer exists. So how does the handling of data work? How, how is the handling of data supposed to work if a user deletes their account, but the material they created on that app still needs to exist. You think they actually delete stuff, huh? No, I know they don't. <laughs> and, but that's what I, from a data, from a table perspective, how does that hand, how does that work? Because if you, you don't want to have a post with a orphaned user ID that doesn't exist anymore. Right. Um, I can start answering this, I guess. Um, so the orphaning problem is significant and you want to design your database so that doesn't happen, right? Like you shouldn't be able to delete a user without deleting all their posts. You shouldn't be able to delete, um, you shouldn't have a post that points to an ID of a user that doesn't exist. Um, so you put a lot of integrity into your data model so that that doesn't happen with foreign key constraints. But yeah, uh, a, a general principle for data, I would say is that we try to avoid really deleting things. Um, it's, it's actually pretty rare that you want to just delete something um, because when you delete it, it's gone. Um, so a lot of times what you'll see is something we call a soft delete where instead of deleting the thing, you put a timestamp on it that says deleted at. And if it has the timestamp for deleted at, then it's been deleted, but it's not actually deleted. And then you keep the whole, you know, in the case of Twitter, that works perfectly. The users, the user thinks that they're not, they don't exist anymore, but all their tweets can stay on the internet, which is what, um, you know, which is how Twitter works. And this is becoming, uh, there's like a massive problem ahead in web development because people actually want to be deleted, right? With the GDPR and um, coming privacy laws, there's like a, gonna be a big demand for actually deleting things. And these applications were not built or designed with that in mind. Uh, so that's gonna be like a huge technical challenge in the next, I don't know, 10 years is like companies changing how they think about deleting. Yeah, if they were to actually, I mean, obviously we don't know exactly what they're doing internally, but they almost certainly are doing some sort of soft delete. If they really did want to delete that data, but keep the tweets around, they would end up um, breaking that foreign key relationship where they would say it is allowed, or they would, they would break the not null on posts, you know, belongs to, you know, user or something like that. And they would allow a tweet to exist with no author. 
and you would just nullify all the, you know, when you deleted the user, you would nullify the user ID of all the tweets. That would be one way to literally delete the data, but still keep their post around. Interesting subject. Jake or Jack, you had mentioned earlier that um, you sent the link about the, the COVID thing where it ended up, um, it was um, in like a spreadsheet instead of a database. And so it had changed it. Is there any reason that you know of why someone is just, yeah, I'm gonna use a spreadsheet instead of a database. Is it cost or, cause that makes absolutely no sense to me. Cause a lot of these people aren't programmers. You know, how many, how many people do you know who could actually do something in Postgres versus how many people do you know who could do something in Excel? Excel is easy or easier. Yeah, another, I I, sorry. I was just gonna say, I think I'm just like assuming that people are going around hiring people like, hey man, there's a lot of important stuff. We need to have this set up so that we can access it and it still has integrity and all that and we can make changes to it when really they're just they're just like, ah, we need to keep this stuff somewhere, so it's gonna go here. <laughs> That's the way it is. I've heard from uh, people I know that have worked in like the financial industry and it's scary how much of the financial industry runs on Excel. Yeah, that's part of it. Another another element is that sometimes, you know, these these data sets are prepared by tools. Um, you might you might have like a, you know, your hospital your hospital record keeping software. The way that it can pre pre the way that it can present information for an export might be like a CSV. Um, you know, it doesn't it doesn't let you have its data. It just puts it out into a CSV. So, you know. Um, at enterprising data scientists is like CSV, perfect. I'll upload that into Excel, and then there you are. Um, so Excel is not not going anywhere, and it it solves a bunch of really good problems. Um, it just isn't, you know, it's hard as programmers. Like we don't want it in that format. You know, we want it. We want the cleanest, most plain text version of the data that we can get. And so. Um, that's just an, a never ending struggle of being a, a programmer is like, oh, it's in Excel. How can we make this a database? Or I wish this was a database. Question. I think it just really bothers me that it's scary, unreliable. <laughs> so. Yeah. Definitely understand that. Um, other questions? Is it oh, you work yep. for Hash Rocket? Um, what is what is what is your guys' business? Do you guys just put out tutorials uh, about different things? Oh yeah, um, Hash Rocket is a web development and mobile consultancy. Um, so we write code for other businesses and this is like a you know a significant portion of the programming world is consulting um so i've had i've had clients where it's basically just like a, a business entrepreneur with an idea and they don't have any programmers and they pay us to build their their idea um and that that the whole other end of the spectrum is the, like the last year I've been on a project where I'm basically like a temporary, I'm basically like a contract worker on a really big team. Um, so they, they're moving really fast and they, they can't hire fast enough or they, they don't want to keep a, a team full time forever. So they, they bring in like five people from a hash rocket. We're our own little team and we like are doing some some part of their application. So we, we built this like really big thing called the checklist for this client. And um, and then when we're done, you know, we're done and they don't have to deal with like five full-time employees. So yeah, I'm in consulting. 
happy to talk more about that. It's definitely like an interesting part of programming that's worth checking out. Er, oh, go ahead, Taylor. You're good, go ahead. For what would you guys say would be like a good benchmark of scale for a SQL coming into entry level jobs? Like, would you say being able to do all the exercises from your guys' repo? Or is that not enough or is that too much? I think if you're going into a development role, I think knowing that much SQL would be great. Because a lot of developers, you know, part of the reason we're, we're teaching this and part of the reason it's at this point of the course is because it's a foundational thing. But a lot of developers, all they ever learn is using like the ORM. You know, in a few weeks, you actually won't write too much SQL by hand. But the thing is, hopefully you now understand what the tool is actually doing for you. But a lot of developers don't understand that. So they'll do things like, okay, you know, we talked about earlier, like, okay, I need one record. Should I do that in SQL or should I do that in Python? Well, if you haven't learned much SQL, you might not realize that, okay, if I do it in Python, that means I'm having the database give me a million records so I can throw away 999,999 of them. Um, so if you actually learn and can like do everything that we talked about today, that's great for a, a junior level to know that type of SQL. Where would you go beyond that? Um, there's, there's a book Jack and I both like called SQL for Smarties. It's pretty cool um, that gives you some like advanced tips and tricks. Uh, and then there's like, you know, an endless amount of diving you can do. The Postgres docs are amazing. Like just keep, if you wanna, if you're really into SQL, just read the Postgres docs. You can learn everything that you could possibly do. And they're just really well-written with great examples. Um, but yeah, I think the cool thing about SQL is that the, um, the surface area of it's pretty small. I mean, we saw a lot of the things, we saw a lot of the keywords today we saw probably half of all the things that I know how to do in SQL like today. It, 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 after that, it's taking those tools and applying them and using problem solving to, in common sense and, you know, intuition to like do cool things, but it isn't like a massive set of things to know. It's more like how, comfort, how com comfortable are you with it? So I think if, if you could learn what we, did today and talk about it, you'd be in a great spot. And, and as Jack said, understanding what the ORM is doing is, is really cool. Um, when, when you use Django ORM or whatever you use, in the end, it's just writing a SQL query. So if you can look at that query and say, oh, this could be done more efficiently um, this way, then you know, you're, you're ahead of most programmers. Yeah, I'll second that opinion about the Postgres docs being really, really, really good. Um, they're, in fact, I'd probably say they're about the best docs you'll find for any open source project or just about any project in general. So unless I'm misunderstanding something, um, Hashrock, it kind of sounds a lot like HLite to me. Uh, like I said, unless I'm misunderstanding. Um, so as far as like consulting, uh, is that more, is it harder to come by? Is there like a lot of competition between companies or have I just like never heard of it? And all of a sudden I've heard of two. So it seems like it's a lot. Oh, um, you're, you're correct. Hashrock and Nathlite are competitors for sure. Um, we're a lot smaller. I mean, ha Eighth light is, I don't know, like 80 developers and Hashrock it is 12. Um, we, we've been around longer than them. Um, I think we're, we do kind of, we, we're both in the same sort of space, but we do slightly different work. And I think we get hired for different kinds of projects. So, I mean, there's like, in America, I'd say there's like 20 consultancies on, in the same like sphere you know, that we're in. So you've got like Hash Rocket, Test Double, ThoughtBot, um, Eighth Light. Um, 
Tandem or Xi. What's Cable that? XI. Oh, I was gonna say like Tandem or Maiden Tandem or whatever. Yeah, Tandem, uh, Table XI. There's uh, Pivotal. I I guess used to be like that, but now they're much bigger. Um, so there's always work. Like Hashrocket's been around for 12 years which is like it's about as long as Ruby on Rails has been around. Um, so there's always stuff for us to do. It is a, it's definitely like a, people describe it as a feast or famine industry where like there are some years where we're all just billing and it's awesome. And there are other years where it's like a little leaner. Um, you, you have to really be very dialed in on what's happening in the industry because it changes, it can change like with the wind. Um, five years ago, all I did was Rails, and um, now I do a lot of React. And like, I had to learn React and become good at React in order to stay um, competitive, which is different than everyone needs to learn, but um, not quite at the same scale and speed, I would say, of consulting. I have a question. Does your um... The company you work for, uh, if you know, like other um, consultancies, do is it usually consultancies that would deal with government contracts or would you guys not really deal with that? Yeah, definitely. Um, my hash rocket doesn't do much for government, but um, some con some consultancies, like um, I have a friend who worked at one called Oddball. Um, that's all they did. You know, they get like lots of, lots of those, but it's, it's a, it, you know, that's a, that's a decision that comes with um, different kind of marketing, different kind of work. Sometimes developers have to get like clearances or um, I don't know what other things, but, um, and you have to submit, like, you have to submit proposals i think to get those kind of work and they're not they're no joke um as far from what i know so uh it's like it's a strategy to go that way it's just not the way that hash rocket has ever really gone yeah it seems that like companies that do de government work they oftentimes like that's all they do they're entirely focused on government contracting As developers for Hashrock, is there ever a time where you might be doing two different projects at once or once a client comes in, company assigns the developers, that's what they're doing for the duration of the project? Yeah, we, well, the company always has like, you know, probably four or five projects, but individual developers, we try to assign um, just to one project. So the, in, the shortest project I've ever had is maybe a month in the longest, we have people who've been on a project for two years, which is, uh, you. I would have said that was like um, an outlier situation, but it seems to be coming pretty common. Um, but yeah, we only do one project and we try to let the people focus on that thing. And um, I think that's the, the best way. Cause it's like, you know, you're like, you're trying to load the whole domain of the client up in your head and do really good work. and. Um, the only exception is I have a couple of like old clients who occasionally like want me to come back and look at something that they've done or like help them out in a tough, difficult situation. And so sometimes rarely I'll get pulled off of a project for like, um, a week to, to do something else, but the current clients don't like that. You know, they don't want it. They don't want that to happen. So, uh, we want to keep the current client happy the most because they're the ones who are currently p keeping the lights on. So we don't do that too much. Do you guys ever find yourself in a position where all of the developers are currently assigned to a project so you can't take on new clients? Yeah, definitely. At HashRocket, it happens all the time because there's only 12 of us. I mean, we've been bigger, we've been up to 22. So we're always somewhere in that range, but our CEO is always turning, turning, turning our way of work. Um, when things are good, when, th you know, when business is really good, uh, we, we can only take three or four projects. So, um, 
what she's always doing is like, oh, you know, we'll be able to start this maybe in March and we'll be able to start this in like April. And if you, if that's not soon enough for you, then, you know, um, we, we have a pretty good relationship with test double and other consultancies. So she'll, she'll like give them the project because they, they do things like a very similar way to the way we would do it. Um, so, uh, it's nice to be in that position where you can choose the work that you do. And, and most of the time we're saying no, you know, to a couple of projects, projects at any given time. What can you uh, say about the uh, tech scene in Chicago? Tech scene you mentioned in Chicago. that earlier. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, my career was formed in the tech scene of Chicago. So I have a lot of, um, a lot of good feelings there, but, um, I, I started programming in, in Los Angeles and then I moved to Chicago to try to get a dev job. Um, and LA has become pretty good, I guess, but it wasn't very good in 2011. There wasn't like much of a tech scene at all. Um, so, it, it had a it had a decent tech scene because it's a giant city, but it wasn't like um, anything noteworthy, in my opinion. Um, Chicago is good. Chicago has a really big Ruby meetup, a really good React meetup. Meetups are like when I think of the tech scene, a meetup is like a lot of what I think of. Mm -hmm. um, but you've also got um, a fairly good amount of like regional conferences um, and a couple of, you know, significant engineering companies have come out of Chicago um, and are headquartered in Chicago. Uh, so I think Chicago is a really good place to look for a tech job among many other good places. What do you think, Jack? Yeah. I mean, when we were when we were all back in the same office, I mean, just within walking distance of us, there was a number of other, you know, tech shops of various sorts, you know, just within a few minutes. And uh, I mean, as far as the city itself, I mean, there's a lot of great places to eat around there. <laughs> so it was, it was a great place to work. But I mean, on the other hand, in this kind of like COVID and hopefully soon post COVID world, you know, it's still a big question up in the air, you know, how much stuff is going to be on site versus remote. You know, I mean, I work from home a fair amount and I've kind of moved out. You know, I'm not in Chicago proper. I'm in Northwest Indiana, you know, Jake went to Maine, you know, so that's kind of a big question. What's, what is the future of that? Do you need to be in a tech hub to get a job? Yeah. I did, uh, I did a lot of meetups in Chicago and I also organized a meetup for about four years um, called Vim Chicago, the, the, the premier Vim meetup of Chicago. Uh, so uh, that's, I, I, I can not say enough about that element of technology. I mean, it, it's, it's not perfect because it's at nights and some people can't participate because they have, you know, other commitments. Um, and so I'm not like saying that's the only way to break into tech, but my job at HashRocket came out of going to a meetup. I went to a meetup. Um, I met somebody who worked there and uh, I just struck up a conversation. And then when I applied, I was able to say like, hey, I met this person uh, at the Chicago Ruby meetup and he told me to apply. And um, that that type of thing doesn't really exist in the in the part of Maine where I live. Um, so it's like, there's a benefit to being in a city like that. I mean, I could go, we could go back and forth on whether you should live in a city and how, what the pros and cons of that are. But if, if Chicago is where you are and you're looking for a job, like I think you're, you're gonna, you're gonna find something. I, I really do believe that. So, yeah, and I actually have a really similar story to Jake. I met uh, a hash racket person at a Chicago Ruby meetup before I, I got hired there as well. And uh, Chicago also has a really good uh, Postgres meetup as well. So these meetups are pretty good for networking then, huh? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, everybody at a meetup is... Um, already 
into code. If you're if you're at a Postgres meetup, you're 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 with a group of people who like Postgres enough to to like go to a meeting about it at night. Uh, so you, that's a good group of people. Like you definitely don't want to show up there and just be like handing out business cards. But like if you go there and you show um, that you're into something and you um, ask good questions and like have you know, an attitude of like an employee that someone would like to work with, you know, I hope that that would open some doors for you. For me, when I was on the job search, meetups really just gave me like, they kind of kept my mind in a good space where I was like, okay, I'm meeting people, I'm making connections, like something's going to happen here. Uh, and I needed that because I, I didn't have any kind of network at all in Chicago. Uh, so I think if that's all you get out of it is just feeling good and like learning stuff, then that's a good reason to go to. Yeah. That would have been my reason to go just to kind of like get better at whatever, you know, like just kind of learn any new skills or improve in any way possible and learn from like people with more experience, you know, I'm yeah. from Chicago. That's why. Yeah. So I'm just wondering. Yeah. When you're starting out, um, you definitely want to like get exposure to other programmers who aren't just the three programmers that you know, you know, like get, if you, if you go to the React meetup, the React Chicago meetup, once you can do that again, and you just pay attention and talk to people, you're gonna like, you're gonna learn a lot really fast because you're gonna be exposed to people who are better than the best programmer that you personally know. And they're gonna push you outside your comfort zone, I think, uh, so. That's why that's another benefit of meetups is just like seeing the bigger tech world, seeing the wide world of technology and not just like the little box that you, you start out in. I also have never really heard of like consulting agencies. Um, do they, do they provide the same essentially financial security as working for a company full time? Or is it kind of like the hours that you work for a client? That's what you get paid. And if there's no current projects going on, you have to wait until you're, you get a client or. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, so the whole like consultants, consulting is a full-time salary job. So um, we get paid whether we're building a client or not, but um, if we go like three months without anyone building a client, the company's going to go out of business because that's just like the way that the business model works, right? So um, we work really hard with our CEO to keep our name prominent and to keep our like our all of our like um, credibility in the industry high. I think um, so that like and keep really good relationships with our clients. So they're coming back and referring people to us. And we're, we're working with our CEO to like make sure Hashrock it like lasts. But yeah, if, if all of us went off, off projects on Monday, I'd still get paid. And part of why people like consulting is it's like a very, um, it's a very like main, sustainable way to program. So my, my, my work week is 40 hours every week, period. No, no weekends. I never work weekends or nights or mornings or holidays. I work 40 hours a week. Five of those hours are um, time that I get to work on whatever I want. So like the salaries for consulting are good. Um, they're higher at a place like Facebook or Google, but um, I work 40 hours a week. So that's like a definite like thing that has to get factored into the math. Um, but it's not, but free, I think you might be thinking like freelance is where if you don't have a project, you don't get any money. Um, that I know some people who do that and that's like a legit way to go too, but you know, I, I won't say it's easy. Um, consulting is like a salaried position and it's up to our boss to keep us engaged and we all work with her to, to, to accomplish that. Um, yeah, consulting's cool. I would definitely say, check it out. It's not a good, it, it's, it's 
most people, it's not their first dev job. It can be. I know Eighth Light takes people from Code Platoon, and if that if that is a path for you, go for it. Um, but mo it's not the most common thing to do. I would say most people start off working at a product shop for a couple of years and then get into consulting and stay for a couple of years, four or five years, and then go do something else. It's like a, it's not really a career stop. I don't think, although some people do that, do that. Can I ask about uh, open source uh, for, for you or for uh, Jack? How important is contributing to open source? I mean, does that matter or is this like personal projects or it's just <laughs> the work we can done? Or how, does that, how does that all play out? I'll answer first because I think Jack has more of a resume there. Um, I've done a a decent amount of open source over the years. So, I mean, I have like the today I learned app is open source. So that's like a public Phoenix application that people have cloned and deployed like hundreds of times. So that's, but it's also really simple. Like I built it four years ago and I don't really work on it anymore. Um, I've contributed to a lot of the big projects, but I've never I've never personally had like a significant contribution. All my contributions have been like um, some really little bug that I found and fixed that like, you know, nobody was asking for. Um, so I don't, I, I think it's cool to be involved in open source, but I definitely don't think you need to do it. I don't, to me, it hasn't really, um, I'm sounding kind of negative here. It, it's cool to know how to interact with programmers in public, have conversations, work a pull request through the process of getting merged. And like, that's all golden stuff to know. But um, for me, open source is mainly like a way for recruiters to spam me because they're like, oh, I saw you contributed to the Phoenix repository and we want a senior Elixir developer. We should hire you. And like, I... <laughs> I did contribute to the Phoenix repository. I, I, I contributed like a sentence to like their documentation or something. That doesn't mean that I'm, I'm like gonna be a great senior Elixir developer for you. Um, so I don't, I, I think I, I'm a bit of a cold shower on open source contribution where I, I don't, I haven't personally had it be like a, a life-changing thing for me, but I've seen other people have it be a life-changing thing for them. Over to you, Jack. Yeah, I mean, I would actually kind of second that. I mean, I've done quite a bit and I have gotten, you know, some connections that, you know, I wouldn't have gotten otherwise in the industry. But, you know, it's also, I, I so I do have a fairly successful project. I, I mentioned at the beginning, the, the Postgres Go driver, uh, PGX is, uh, is my project. And, you know, the downside of it is I spend an hour or two or three for, for you know, working on it every week, and I don't get paid for it. <laughs> so, um, so I mean, I think it definitely does help if you have two identical developers and one has this successful project and one doesn't. Sure, it's a win for the one who does, but I don't think it's a like it's certainly not a requirement or anything either. Yeah, yeah, we hire people every year at HashRocket who don't have like some big successful open source project. So it's like, it's a nice to have, but um, it's, it's hard. It can be hard work. Like you're working on something for free that you don't get paid. Um, and uh, you, you can be a great programmer and not do that. And um, open source does select a little bit for people who have free time to do that type of thing, right? Like some people don't have that time. So if that's like a thing that you're, if you're, if that's like your bar, is it like, oh, the, they better have some significant open source thing I can look at, then I think you're gonna miss some really good people. Um, like there are great people who have nothing open source. So you have to like, you don't want to like limit yourself from seeing those people. Um, and I think that, especially for people like just getting into the industry, like 
yeah, if you get a commit in on like Django or something, that's awesome. That's something you could bring up in a, in a interview and be really proud of. And um, that's great. But like, I wouldn't be like pursuing that. Like it was some kind of like Holy grail for hiring um, because I don't really think that it is. It's just something to talk about. And you could show me, you could show me a, a implementation of um, tic-tac-toe that you wrote. And I would also find that interesting. And that would be enough for me to like figure out where you are as a programmer. Yeah, but that's one thing about it. It's very helpful to have something you can show that you did. Mm -hmm. For sure. Um, I'm happy to keep chatting if there's more questions. I've got till, I know you all, it's near the end of the day. Um, other questions? Going once. Okay, um, well, um, I can start by saying that uh, once again, Thanks to Code Platoon for bringing us back. Um, always awesome to be here with you all. And um, thank you for sticking with us for this whole day and getting Postgres installed and typing in the commands and um, answering questions and being engaged. I really, really appreciate that. Thank you for your service and for being um, supportive of those who served. And um, I'm going to be. I'm, I'm like invested in code platoon long term. So like I'm always in Slack and stuff. If you have questions or want to reach out to me, um, please feel free to do that. And when I finish up today, I'll post my contact info in the November channel. And then also a, um, a survey on our course today. If you want to give us feedback, um, we would definitely appreciate that. Um, so I'd just like to say thank you and I'll turn it over to Jack. Yeah, um, I'm not usually on the Slack channel like to see just normal notifications, but I'm there if you want to DM me, you know, be happy to answer any questions. And uh, like Jake said, it was, uh, we're really glad to be here and we hope you got something out of it. All righty, well, turn it over to the instructors. Have a great rest of your day. Thank Thanks you. a lot for all that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All right, so uh, yeah, that was uh, quite a bit for today, the sequel. So um, does anyone have any questions or issues? We're still just working on the assignments, the do these in order one through. Yeah, yeah so it's basically the same. It's kind of the same uh, uh, material for the whole week. So it's just a matter of how you to it. So, I mean, there's also new material that you got for today. So if you want to go back and review and maybe redo uh, some of those examples that they gave you on, on your own pace. So yeah, all those resources are available. So this is, in some ways, it's a self-paced week as far as that goes. Um, yeah, so I don't know if Tom is anything, but I'm inclined to no, um, yeah, uh, just a lot of information we're throwing at you all today. Um, what'd you all think of the, uh, the sequel workshop? It was great. Yeah, uh, yeah, a lot of information. <laughs>